JP, good to finally meet you. This is kind of cool for me. Well, it, cool for me too. I'm so happy to be here with you, brother. And uh, we should we should address the elephant in the room. Um, did Bill Gates do this to you because you were mean to him? Uh, no, though he tried, obviously. Yeah. I escaped his wrath. Um, but no, this is my AOC strategy to victimize myself and get attention from people. I... It's kind of a strategy where the more you can disempower yourself, the more empowered you are. Yeah. So, but no, I don't know what it was. Probably two and a half months ago at this point, I was wakeboarding. Hadn't wakeboarded in years, but friends and I rented a, a, a lake house. And then one of the days we had a wakeboarding boat. So I used to be pretty good at wakeboarding. I just turned 40, so I'm in denial of my age. My wife is in the boat. She's never seen me wakeboard before. So I'm just all in my ego a, wait, a full week before this trip, just like I'm going to impress her with my wakeboarding skills. Like she cares about wakeboarding, but she did according to my mind. So it's my turn. I'm up for all of 30 seconds and I'm like, all right, time to impress her. I did this little jump backside spin thing. Timing was off. Haven't done one for 15 years. Caught my edge, went down and I looked down at my knee and my kneecap was kind of about mid thigh, not supposed to be there. So long story short, turns out I severed my patella tendon. Oh, wow. I don't recommend it. No. Uh, it's, <laughs> if I would have been, only been vaccinated, it would have been okay, probably. I, I think that's probably what it was. Yeah. Um, if you'd only listened to Fauci. <laughs> he, he's the one that did my surgery, by the way. Uh, excellent surgeon. Doesn't know anything about anything else. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I had the surgery, uh, not by Fauci, thank God. And so I'm on the road to recovery for sure. Did your wife just leave you there embarrassed or did she fish you out? And No, so she definitely couldn't help me. I mean, I was as useless as I could get. So uh, luckily I have a friend, he used to be like a champion CrossFitter. I mean, he's 4,000 times stronger than me. So he deadlifted me into the boat by my life jacket. Otherwise, I think I'd Still just wave around. goodbye. Yeah. 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 And then she, my wife didn't even go with me to the emergency room. She acted like she needed to get back to our baby. So I, I clearly didn't injure myself enough yeah. to get all the attention I wanted. Yeah, wives. Yeah. I don't know what you do. <laughs> but uh, I, so I wanted to talk to you about a lot of stuff and we can go anywhere you want on this. But, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of a YouTube superstar. And well, I'm, you're being very humble, Matt. I mean, really uh, significant. You are the Thank YouTube you. superstar. Thank you. <laughs> that and that guy that eats chicken wings. Yeah, he's, his content's yeah, predictable. He's, he's, he's sort of nipping at your heels. But uh, I, I think I started watching your videos like in 2015. You did the, the one about um, if carnivores acted like vegans. Yeah. And so what was your... Um, and. At some point, I, I read your Wikipedia page today and I learned things that I didn't know and maybe some of it was true, but like, when did you decide to start doing these YouTube videos? So about seven years ago, I decided to do one YouTube video and that one was called How to Be Ultra Spiritual. This is my spiritual life's been super important to me. I used to live in Southern California and, and having just been immersed in this spiritual culture, which I love, I realized like, man, there's a lot of egotistical stuff in this spiritual culture, including my ego. But funny thing about that is all the egotistical stuff hides behind noble looking spiritual hiding spots. And, and I like to call myself out on that because I think the, the more I do, the less I'm deceiving myself. I think the more self-aware we are of our own egotistical nature, Unless our egotistical nature controls us. Yeah. So I thought, well, let, let me make this little video portraying that. So I, I did just thinking this will be a one-time video. I don't know how to make comedy videos. It probably won't even be funny, but got to do it. And I did. And, and it, I mean, shockingly, it caught on pretty decently. I mean, way more views than anybody should get on their first video. And that, that woke something up inside of me. About three weeks later, one morning I was sitting there and said, maybe I should make another video. 
And then I did. Were there angels? Like, was it a moment? They, uh, well, a uh, squirrel had a seizure by me, <laughs> and that really woke something up inside of me. Uh, but no, I mean, it, 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 at first it was just one video at a time, and then yeah. maybe after nine months, I realized, oh, I'm I'm tapping into a well of creativity that's not really running dry. Yeah, and that's when I realized, like, cool, I'm onto something no premeditated path of like, let's grow this into what it is today or premeditated path. Here's how I can make my living from it. It was just like, well, let me forest gump my way along, do my best to follow my heart and make stuff that inspires me, reveals a truth as I see it and amuse myself yeah. along the way. You know, the, the, the metaphor of, of that particular community that you were so intensely part of um, you could skewer almost any passionate community. Um, but the yeah. one I'm thinking of is politics, where the, the rhetoric is so noble and the self-importance is, <laughs> is so, like, it's such a weight. But if you scratch beneath the surface, it's it's almost 99% bullshit. It, it is. The, the, th the thing the spiritual culture has going for it that politics doesn't, the spiritual culture at least tries to hide the bullshit the politics it's like no here it is yeah i'm gonna lie right to your face you're gonna know it. i'm gonna know it and we're gonna pretend like i'm not yeah and so i'm violating you for your benefit and like you're i'm supposed to be offended if you call me a liar yeah so i i agree with your perspective that any group you can find the same pattern and i think fortunately or unfortunately politics is where the the pattern probably has the widest di diameter and kind of like the strongest hurricane winds. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I, and I, I love the attitude of being sort of self-aware and self-critical. And I'm one of my favorite tribes that I've been in a long time is libertarians. Yeah. And we're super weird. And we spend a lot of time fighting with each other about things that really don't matter that much. <laughs> and there's, there's that same sort of, uh, it, it infects the, you know, I call it a tribe in a, in a sort of a negative sense. Like people just, people get all wrapped around the axle about things that matter less than, oh, hey, the world is locking us down and we're not allowed to go out of our houses. Maybe we should focus on that, maybe, but yeah. we don't. We fight with each other instead. <laughs> I love that. Well, and I'm curious. And I know other groups fight with each other. Like you go inside the nutrition community, there's in fighting vegans versus carnivores, things like that. And even like vegans fighting with other vegans, like you're not vegan enough and you yeah. cook your food. What the fuck is wrong with you? Yeah. So I'm curious, even if it's just within the context of libertarianism, why do you think we're compelled to fight with each other? I think it's, um, I mean, first, I mean, on the upside is we care. Like we're, yeah. we've embraced a philosophy because we're worried about what tyranny and, and dumb government can do to people's lives. And, and the core of it is that, like we actually are, are thinking about something bigger than ourselves, but we're also like really passionate people that have read certain people. And, and um, you know, my joke about libertarians is that there's only one libertarian and that's me. <laughs> and everybody else is not really a they're, libertarian. They're not, not up to the standard. Uh, but I think it's about any anybody that's passionate about anything. You yeah. you you learn something, you gather, and and sometimes if you get carried away, you you sort of focus on the negativity of those disagreements instead of like engaging other people on these beautiful ideas. Yeah, I I love that perspective, and I'd imagine the light side of the fighting. I, I just imagine like in relationships. You know, I've had past girlfriends where we never fought and that was a problem. Yeah. There was just so much damn indifference. You know, the relationship should have ended a year ago, but I'm too chicken and yeah. whatever. So we just never fight. And and I've had mentors along the way say, well, JP, that's a problem. Yeah. You don't need to fight abusively. But, you know, fighting is a sign of passion and passion is a sign of caring. So I... Yeah, I love your perspective that y'all care yeah. what's going on. And of course, I think the shadow side is too much fighting. There's, you know, the passion gets misdirected into spinning one's wheels. 
So whatever the right balance is, I'd imagine some fighting's necessary, but you cross a line. Yeah, and- there's there's good fights and then there's unproductive fights, but that's like if you're going back to the relationship thing, like imagine a real relationship where there were no disagreements. Yeah. That would that would be pretty Orwellian. It unfortunately would be. Maybe yeah. it was. I don't know. It, and uh, welcome to the relationship we have with big tech and the government. Yeah. It's, it's great. We're not allowed to disagree. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I, um, I, I just listened to the, it's a fairly recent podcast where you, you, I think the title was Why I've Changed. Yeah. And I thought, that was, uh, thought it was interesting because, because I get this. I get this small L libertarian individualistic perspective going all the way back to the first videos I watched from you. And, and satire is a way to sort of puncture people and remind them of their humility. Um, but you have changed. Mm-hmm. And, and you say it was the lockdowns. Yeah. Yeah, I, I th- uh, I've changed, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. But also, along with me changing, the world has changed. So it probably, if someone's been paying attention, might look like I've changed dramatically. But part of it is like, And the world's changing. Like the left has gotten way leftier. So uh, anybody who's standing there, you look at the background of the left, lean, all right, it looks like we've changed, but maybe you just stood still. But yet to own it, uh, first off, I love changing. You know, uh, I think sometimes we pretend like people need to be discredited if they change. And I kind of think the opposite, like, if you don't change, maybe you should be discredited because yeah. change means you're learning, you're growing, you're you're changing your mind because you're hopefully improving your mind. And of course, that's not to say, oh, someone's changed their mind because Bill Gates slid the right amount of money in their pocket or whatever. Like, no, that's not growth oriented change. Right. That's diminishing oriented change. So, yeah, for me, the lockdowns happen. And that was the genesis of my change after two, three weeks of that, I start to wake up like, all right, this is, this isn't, well, something's going on here that we're not being told about, you know, back, back then last year, uh, at the, at the time research was coming out of USC showing like, Hey, the infection weights are way higher than we thought, but guess what? That's good news. That means the death rates are way lower than we thought. And it's like, awesome. This is good news. Cause like the first couple weeks of this thing, i bought into the fear of it but then look at the the authoritarian leaders and well they weren't changing public policy they're actually just doubling down acting like we're finding out this thing's deadlier than ever but we realize no no no, it's it's less deadly than you thought like what's going on so i love to call out hypocrisy lies deception anywhere i see it whether it's nutrition world and now getting into the pandemic world and so what changed in me a couple of things i privileged white male i've never really had freedoms taken away from me and also right at that time i learned my wife's pregnant with our first child now a switch flipped in me there, I, I, you know, it's part of that million year old instinct that lives through that helps perpetuate humankind where it, you, one way you protect your children is by making the world around them a better place. So they're going to be more protected. So switch flipped in me where, you know, I've always wanted to do meaningful work and help the world, but now it was just like, I need the world to be as good as possible for my son to thrive and I see a really dark cloud that's not on the horizon. It's here and it could get a lot darker. So freedom's my number one value, but it was never threatened before. So as freedoms get taken away, the dark cloud, like, uh, but, but that was always there. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, I started devoting my work to freedom, helping hopefully wake people up from fear, freeing themselves from fear that doesn't serve them and ultimately getting in touch with their own minds, their own hearts, because I think our nature is intrinsic. I think to help free people, you don't need them to be brainwashed with your thinking. That's just a different kind of slavery. You just need to get them in touch with their own nature because their own nature is free. So 
I just became pro freedom in some of the, like mentioned the spiritual culture a few minutes ago, a lot of that culture for reasons I don't really understand. They always lean left mm -hmm. they, on the whole, they lean left. And when I started bringing content out like pro freedom, I was getting backlash from the left. I'm like, Oh no, no, no. Like you guys, you don't understand like pro freedom. Like what, what's the problem here? And then I start to realize we're not dealing with a medical issue. We're dealing with a political issue where this whole group of people, and I don't want the whole, there's so many free freedom oriented people in the spiritual culture, but also some aren't. So these people who preach live out of love, not fear, they're getting mad that I'm advocating. You don't live your life in fear. Yeah. So it's like, I like, whatever, I got to be true to my truth and I need to make the world as good of a place for my son and uh, contribute to what I can with the people around me. Yeah. So freedom and the desire for it to reclaim it and bring more of it into my life and the world. That's what changed. You know, you were, you were a life coach and, and I've, I've watched some of your stuff on that, but, but this whole way that fear gripped us this time, like, I feel like authoritarians left, right, center, wherever they're coming from, finally have a weapon to use against us. And it's the fear that we might get sick. Yeah. Or, which is really just the fear of the unknown. Yeah. Because because getting sick and, and developing an immune system is not a new thing. <laughs> um, I don't think. But it's sort of you mentioned AOC and, and the the culture of victimhood. I think there's a there's a cancerous idea there that you're not responsible for your life if you're feeling shitty or miserable. Yeah. And you're looking to somebody else, you're looking to outsource that responsibility and and that risk taking, in this case, to political leaders, help me be better than I am. Yeah. And to me, that's the, the core, like even more so maybe than, than the pandemic, because all they did was scare us to death and we just handed over everything. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and if you read about abusive relationships, whether it's a you know, guy abusing his wife or sexual abuse happening, a neighbor with a child. You, it's all fear is the tool of coercion and deception is used with that. Yet you got to get the victim afraid and then you let the victim know you're here for their protection. I'm here for you. No, no, no. I'm not harming you. I'm helping you. And that's a hypnotic induction and it becomes a hypnotic induction when someone's afraid, you know, when someone's not afraid, they're not in a hypnotically suggestible state, but you get them afraid. Like, Oh, by the way, here's the death toll. You haven't seen it for four seconds. Look, it's going up and guess what it's going to do. Tomorrow's going to go up higher. And so there's all the fear left, right, and center thrown at us by our leaders. Now, my opinion, they're not leaders. They're people in authoritarian positions. I have a, for me, a leader is someone who truly leads people, not suppresses people. For me, a leader is someone who helps lift people out of fear that doesn't serve them. So it it's absolutely crazy and mind boggling. But the my circle back to my point, you know, if someone knows anything about abusive relationships and how bu abuse gets perpetuated, you see that same pattern happening with our leaders and us. And we can all hear this story about the abused woman, you know, with the wife beating husband. She's with him for years. We can all sit back and say, like, wow, what, why doesn't she just leave him? Why is she, like, staying slave to him? Why do we still listen to our leaders? It's the same answer. And I think we need to find that answer because we need to free ourselves. Yeah. I mean, you've, you've done things about the, the genius of America. And this is, this is a part of your new portfolio, I think, maybe. Um, but it, it goes back to this. And my answer was always like, don't trust politicians because their incentives are to control and manipulate us to grow their power. Yeah. And that's not a Republican thing or a Democratic thing. It's just the way it is. But our system was designed so that the people would call bullshit on that. Mm. And that seems to be the part that we've lost yeah. in, this, in this mass hysteria. 
and it's not like COVID didn't start this, but like it shocked me. And I'm a cynical libertarian that sees um, the monsters in the in the woods all the time. So I'm like, what 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 flipped the switch? Man, uh, it, it de- depends on how deep into the rabbit hole we want to go, and it. And I don't know for certainty anything, yet if we go a little ways down the rabbit hole, I mean, it it looks like there may have been a, a really orchestrated plan to flip the switch. Yeah. I mean, you start hearing about things like Event 201, like, you know, you get Bill Gates in there. I know we were joking about him earlier, and but you start to realize, like, oh, they rehearsed the pandemic. And you can say, well, they were rehearsing a defense against the pandemic. And it's, well, that's one way to look at it. And I'm curious about the other possibility as well. So I don't know. I, I don't know much about history, but I'm smart enough to know there's a thing called history. And I know anybody born in the U.S., I don't care what your circumstances are, but you're fortunate to have been born in the U.S. around this time. So we get other perspectives when we look at history. You, you look at what the hell the Nazis did. You look at the installing of an authoritarian regime, Stalin, Mao, and, and you, you realize like at one point in time, these people were free. Like an authoritarian takeover, it, it begins to happen. And kind of like uh, the old saying, absolute power corrupts absolutely. So... You know, humans have a tough time dealing with power. So it seems to be based on history. I wish it wasn't this way, but it seems to be based on history. You leave people with power long enough and you'll get a corrupt expression of it. And and of course, that looks like control over other people. You know, I think the currency of control is what matters more to authoritarian regimes than even the currency of money, because money just allows you to control. So money is the middleman to control. It's just a really psychotic, e- warped ego way that authoritarian people look to fulfill themselves through controlling other people. So I don't know what flipped the switch, but looking at history, it seems like it's always just a matter of time before an attempt to take over people happens. Yeah. And and I wish I lived in a utopian mind that said, no, we live in the U.S. Like, don't be stupid. That happens like in places that they don't speak English. And that happens in history not here, not to us. And my thought is like, yeah, hopefully not here and not to us. That's why I want to wake up and and be sovereign and not live under the hypnosis of fear. Because, I mean, what everybody listening to this already knows, the only way the few can control the many is through fear. And without that, their authoritarian takeover short of running around the streets and literally shooting everybody. They can't do it. Yeah. I mean, power is always the currency and, um, it's, it's almost seems like we keep living through the movie groundhog day (laughs) when you talk to, to young people and they, you know, they've added the D word democratic to their brand of socialism. Um, and so we've we've done these. I mean, it's deeply depressing, and we had to stop because these guys were were tired of of doing um, documentaries about mass genocide under Mao or Jesus. Stalin or Pol Pot, and and this, the story kind of plays out the same way every time. Yeah. Um, and yet, young people say, "Well, that wasn't real socialism. Yeah, that was something else. That was <laughs> that was." <laughs> Let's try it again, but do it right yeah. this time. <laughs> And that's that's the frustrating thing to me is like there's this um, there's this pretense that you know if we just tweak it just a little bit yeah the, the motor will run this time it, it, and I think we can go back to the old definition of insanity doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result it's insane even if there's a little tweak and try that same thing over again and I'm curious you know I read. Um, I forget the source, so please forgive me for being uneducated. But I read 
with Generation Z, a full one third of them would support communism in our country and a full 49% of Generation Z wants socialism in our country. Why in the hell do you think that is? I, and, and we do a lot of thinking on this and communicating on this question and that, that data is, if anything, it's optimistic. The numbers okay. might actually be slightly worse than that. And part of it is words and the multiple meanings of words like socialism. Um, I don't think socialism means what you and I understand it to mean, which is, is top-down, one-size-fits-all authoritarianism where the individual has no rights because that's what it's been in history. And if you actually look it up, that's what they meant. They're replacing, there's, there's this phrase called dictatorship of the proletariat. Doesn't sound very democratic to me, but um, the, the problem is they hear the word social and they're like, oh, people working together from the bottom up to solve problems. And like, if that's what they're thinking, I'm like, I'm with you. That's, yeah. that's my model um, sure. too. And we can disagree on what it is, but unfortunately in practice, it's hard to get to their version, AOC's version of socialism without taking away all of our rights. Yeah. It's sort of like you, you did this thing on guns, take away all our guns and give it to the people in power because, well, just because they're better people and we can trust them. And the people with guns told us to give up. Yeah. <laughs> they told us guns are dangerous, so we should. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, and I wonder, it seems like people who are, who have a great relationship with self-responsibility, it seems like they're all about, like, Whatever's not socialism, capitalism, just to put it bluntly, uh, freedom might actually be freedom. the other. Yeah. But when people haven't been intimate with their self-responsibility, when they haven't worked through the psychological and physical discomforts that absolutely have to come with self-responsibility, and P.S., that's what makes us grow. Yeah. Uh, this growing pains got to be uncomfortable or you're not growing. So it seems like people who don't have that relationship with self-responsibility are the ones that want someone else's responsibility. Where you hear socialism here in the Gen Z culture and you never hear about it with like fucking bloodstained pages. It's always the Bernie Sanders AOC version that's never been implemented in history but like we think it'll work this time so i can see how that could appeal to the psyche of someone who is castrated enough that they're not in touch with their power of self-responsibility yeah. i mean I, I hear that in in aoc's conversations that she has she, she she talks about never having had a chance to be prosperous and that this is not a country where um, you can find dignity no. and and I'm not blaming her for that but it is this mindset that that somehow somewhere along the way we taught young people that um, dignity is really hard work no. and it involves this very uncomfortable process this endless uncomfortable process that you're talking about of, of self-reflection and humility and working your ass off and failing. Yeah. All of that. Wouldn't it be funny if this whole thing was caused by uh, the millennials getting the first place trophies no matter what? Like, <laughs> that was the genesis. That was the moment. Like, nothing else but just like, oh, you don't have to feel the discomfort of second place or last place. So here you go. And now we're like, oh, uh, no, we're going to have communism because of that. Yeah. Uh, probably not. But it's interesting. I, I good friends with. Have you ever heard of a guy named Tim Kennedy? No. no. He's a, a special forces sniper, Green Beret. Used to be in the top five UFC. So he's someone who's killed for his country. Had friends killed right by him. He's been in three day long gunfire fights. He's been in the UFC cage fighting for world titles. He's someone who. Uh, embraces discomfort more than anything and just a quick story about a year and a half ago well before i blew my knee out i did a workout with them and yeah i show up i'm think i'm a pretty fit guy and it took me a month to recover from this workout with this son of a bitch because he goes 
so deep and so dark into discomfort that it's like, man, I, I've never been to this territory before at a physical level. It yeah. took me a month yeah. to recover. So, but I look at him and, you know, I don't not need to worship him, but he's like the freest human I know. Like he hopes the shit hits the fan. He's yeah. like, JP, I've been training for this all my life. He's equipped. He knows how to live off the land. He took me on my first hunt. He can feed his family. He's got all the ammunition that you'll ever need. So, but I see him as the freest person I know. So what makes him that free? And, and of course he's developed skills. He has, you know, special forces training, that kind of thing. But I think the more baseline denominator is he's the freest person I know because he makes himself the most uncomfortable more than anybody else I know. And, and I think we live in a culture, I mean, the nerf culture, it's been, I don't know, decades where that's, that term has been a thing, whether that's kids aren't on the farm doing hard stuff or, Maybe they're getting removed from sports. You know, that's a way to embrace discomfort or like, eh, well, your teacher gave you an F. We're going to go talk to the teacher. We don't like you feeling that kind of discomfort. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't, I'm not a parenting expert, but I, th I think young people, old people, all people need some very regular therapeutic doses of discomfort. Otherwise, oh, the pillow of socialism. Cool. Let's yeah. do that. I, I think you're on to something, and I, th I think those that first participation trophy was the end of human civilization as we know it, and and you can sort of see it played out under COVID with parents making their two-year-old kids wear masks, yeah. even though there is zero data yeah. to support that, and and like there are politicians that lie about that, and Fauci still lies about it, but um, there is a, a, as objective as we can be about. Um, a moving target like a novel virus, um, they're still doing it because they want zero discomfort, zero danger, yeah. zero threats. Um, and I guess they don't ever want to die. Like yeah. it, it's getting that weird. Yeah. Well, you know, that's interesting. The fear of death might be like the ultimate discomfort in someone's mind. And, and we get to be in denial that right. we're going to die. Like we, Every human that's ever lived has either died or will die. But we stay in denial of that. We're like, well, if I just if I play it safe enough, I'll live forever. But nobody tells us the minute you are born, you're at risk of dying. And you can make the purpose of your life to save your life. Or you can make the purpose of your life to live your life. And my friend Tim Kennedy, he has a beautiful saying. He says... You can either choose peaceful slavery or dangerous freedom. The choice is yours. And I think why he says dangerous freedom is because that's the emotions you feel. Yeah. With freedom comes danger. Like I, I know, you know, after a while ago when I started sit like, okay, the mask, I'm not wearing it into the stores. If the clerks need to say something to me, we'll have that conversation. But I want to be a beacon of freedom and I'll see people in the store who will like, see me without a mask on. Then I see them take theirs off. Uh, I want to do that for people. Yeah. And, but I, I remember when I started like, all right, screw the mask. Like I was ashamed of how many butterflies I had. Like, Whoa, I have like, there's some uncomfortable feelings. So like that was the danger of freedom I yeah. was feeling. Yeah. And I think in truth, it's a paradox Freedom's the safest thing we'll ever have. It just feels dangerous. And this whole peaceful slavery, protect yourself at all costs. All right, well, well you're protecting yourself. You've imprisoned yourself. That's the most dangerous thing you could ever do. It's just the illusion is the most dangerous thing you could ever do feels safe. But the safest you could ever do, be free, feels dangerous. I think about my professional life and anything that I would embrace as, as personally satisfying, you know, achievements that I've done in my career um, were preceded by lots of fear yeah and it, it was so uncomfortable and 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 failing by the way sucks really bad and there's no way to succeed in, unless you do all that stuff along the way 
And this is why I think this participation trophy, this is our theory of, of social change. But back to your, you know, your question about young people and whether or not they're flirting with communism and socialism, I do think that underneath those words, there are values. Yeah. You're using the word freedom, um, uh, self-responsibility, and I would even lump in words like community, like a sense of, of cooperation and, and the really beautiful things you could do together. Yeah. As long as everybody's in, right? Because it's not it's not community if if some authoritarian is holding a gun at your head. Yeah, that's the opposite of that. So I, I I'm I'm optimistic, cautiously about uh, Generation Z. I think they're up for grabs. Yeah, and I think they've been poisoned. And part of the poison is is the the, the corruption of the language, and because liberal used to mean freedom. And I would call myself a classical liberal in that sense. Yeah. And uh, you know, one of my heroes, an intellectual named Frederick Hayek, he complained about the word libertarian because he's like, that's a made up word. I want my word and my word is liberal. Yeah. And he was critical of conservatives and he was critical of, um, he, he, he organized it liberal versus socialists and fascists and authoritarians. Mm. And they were all kind of on the same side or the bottom, however you want to organize that yeah. chart. You know, it's interesting with the words changing. It. I did a video a couple weeks ago called, uh, what the hell is it called? Something like woke vocabulary. You know, learn the, the new speak. Yeah. And what, you know, what I've realized through my delusional blue eyes the past while is, you know, Meaning doesn't change, but the words we use to convey the meaning that does change, and and I think part of Marxism is weaponizing words in order to capture a meaning that you know comes from a good-hearted individual. So you you switch out words in order to manipulate people. So you don't change the meaning; you just change the words. That's, you know, liberal it has changed. Yeah. And then you look at, I mean, the whole identity politics where there's this war on language. And it, and there are some, I think there's some pretty corrupt people. I mean, like BLM, the founders, like they say we're Marxists. <laughs> like I think Marxists is an act of evil. Probably good hearted people just horrible intentions on top of that but you know i look at that and it's like man there's there's just a destruction of language and they're attempting to destroy truth along the way you know for you we've probably all heard about you know, not too long ago someone got banned off twitter for saying men can't give birth and then the, yeah, i remember that yeah. so now we're not doing truth okay yeah, yeah. Um, great. Man, we, we didn't agree on much, but we used to agree on that. We used to. <laughs> and so the meaning of things has changed. And there was a video, I think a guy named Will Witt did. Uh, he's with um, PragerU. And he was going around a college campus just asking people, what is a woman? You just heard all these bullshit. Well, you know, is there anybody who wants to be a woman? And... You know, but like nobody could define what a woman is. It, it takes one sentence. I grew up like by the time I was probably three, I could tell you what a woman is. So now we're even changing the meaning of the word woman. Yeah. Which is interesting. I, again, the meaning doesn't change, but you slide words across the shuffleboard. And now I think we're manipulating people. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's definitely, I, I'm actually trying to figure out this critical theory thing and wokeism and cultural Marxism and all these categories that are thrown around. And there's, it, it kind of goes back to something you were saying earlier because, um, you know, the, you know, postmodern, postmodernism in its best sense was about having a little bit of humility about language. Mm. And there's a word called hermeneutics, which was all about interpreting the things that people say to get to what they really mean. Mm. And to me, that's a healthy skepticism that too, like you can't just hear somebody and they use a word that triggers you and you decide that, that, oh, they're full of shit. Yeah. Because it's more complicated than that. 
And a little bit of humility and self-awareness is a good thing when you're trying to figure out a super complex world and you're trying to get to something closer than truth. But what all this stuff you're talking about is not that. It's the opposite of that. And it's designed to keep us confused and pissed off at each other. Yeah. And that that's the Marxism part. Like, if, if we're all, instead of dividing us by class, we're divided by intersectionality. Yeah. Um, we're all enemies of each other and we and ultimately no one is good everybody's bad but some people are less bad than other people and and one of my friends that was on the show she survived Mao's cultural revolution mm-hmm. as a as a young girl and she's like this is the same thing same exactly. thing that Mao did to us so there is there is some history there yeah and and that's why you've you've come out of the closet yeah. like you're you're kind of a flame throwing truth seeker now how has that affected your business? Uh, it's been phenomenal. And, and I'll backtrack real quick. Uh, last April, so April 2020, when I realized like, all right, there's, there's a lot in this well of content that wants to be expressed with regard to giving current events a narration to hopefully shine the light of awareness on corruption, hypocrisy, deception. And at the time, like I realized like, well, I've never done anything about politics, politics, never gave a crap about politics, but just right now, freedom is in the arena of politics. So I'm okay going there, but I'm sure I'll piss off half my audience and people leave me, but also like, I can't just sell out and like not speak my truth in order to like try to keep people. It's yeah. like, I don't want to be a sellout, but I got to do it. So as I went along, I started to get really surprised. My, my audience had never grown quicker, bigger, faster as I doubled down on a more bold truth than I ever had before. And, and that's great. It wasn't premeditated. It wasn't a business strategy. I thought I was doing like the bad business strategy, but yeah. I'm not business motivated. I'm more truth and creator motivated. So it's been great. And, you know, I, I think what I do for people, if I could be pretentious enough to just talk about me for a minute, uh, I think what I do for people and why my audience has grown so much in the past year and a half is I give people a voice to say say what needs to be said for them to be represented in a way where they ain't represented when they turn on CNN. They're not represented by social media. I mean, social media might be censoring, whatever it is. So I realized like, oh, I'm a, I'm a voice for people. And now granted they have their own voice. They need to use it. That's what's most important. But I'm also a surrogate voice for people. And, and I think that's why my audience has grown so much. It's also like you're, I mean, you're a comedian. Um, you're not a moral philosopher. Yeah. Not that you have to choose one or one or the other of those two things, but you've, you've taken those values and, and made it kind of fun. Like it's, it's fun to watch one of your videos. It's not like watching a, a Cato Institute lecture yeah. from a podium that's poorly shot and poorly mic'd. It's, <laughs> there's, it's hopefully bit better than that yeah hopefully yeah (laughs) some of them hopefully are um yeah and you know i think uh, you know i my path being a a comedian and and i don't think making people laugh is the most important goal it's just a a means to uh, accomplish the more important goal of helping get people more in touch with their own heart and their own head or their own mind and i think what happens when a message is spoken through the language of comedy rather than like a preaching message like here's what you need to believe you know when the message is just preached at us if we're not ready to hear it or consider it i think what happens is our psychological defenses come up we're like hey i have what i believe to be true in my mind and i don't want that to change so anything that's going to change it i'll perceive as a threat so our defenses come out and we resist even if it's absolute truth coming at us that could help us. Yeah. We resist it. But when something, that same message is presented through the language of comedy, 
So same message, just presented differently. I don't think the ego defenses come up nearly as much because it's like, hey, this is like the vibe of not preaching, but playfulness. So it seems much less threatening to our psychological homeostasis. So the messages can maybe get in and we can consider them and of course spit them out if they're not resonating with us. And I think what how I use comedy, I liken it to how I like give my dogs medicine. If I give them the pill, they're going to spit it out. But if I wrap the medicine in cheese or meat, then they'll swallow it. Yeah. Then they'll go puke on the rug. My my cat doesn't fall for that, by the way. Yeah, you have a very you know, s- your cat would not like my stuff then. Cats are more libertarian than dogs. You understand? It's, <laughs> it's very yeah, true. D- dogs dogs just want socialism, right? They do. Is there whatever, finally we're finally. pack animals. I have this. Uh, people get so pissed off about it, but I argue that cats are libertarians and dogs are communists because <laughs> they're always looking for a handout. They definitely want uh, affirmation from a third party to to yeah. find their self worth, and cats don't give a fuck. Yeah. Like, I'm, they my, don't. I'm my own damn self. Yeah. And you can, I don't recommend that. Please don't. Uh, animal abuse sucks, but you could beat a dog and that dog will stay loyal to you. And there's the, you know, communist people being beaten and, you know, Stockholm syndrome being very loyal to their, uh, their authoritarian dogs will eat poop. And that's yeah. kind of what you start to get in the bread lines. That's in the negative. Yeah. Yeah. And it's one of the bad things. <laughs> yeah. So do you think communism first came from people, then transferred to dogs? Or did communism, like a virus, kind of like Fauci world, where viruses apparently come from wild animals now? Um, <laughs> this one doesn't. But uh, do you think communism started in dogs and then like a virus transferred to people? I, I think it's the opposite. It's like Planet of the Apes, where mm. the... Dogs were infected by dumb people with this philosophy. And the good news is that even dogs are learning from this because in Venezuela, if you're a dog and a pet, you've probably been eaten by your owner at this point yeah. because they couldn't afford to buy food. Yeah. So this, this got dark. It yeah. did. Who in the, but we have more important places to go within this realm. In the dog world, who do you think is Bernie Sanders? Um, I think he's a rat dog. A rat dog. <laughs> yeah, because he's he's always biting at your ankle and yeah. and barking at you. Um, he's not a he's not a big fluffy dog. He's a little rat dog. Yeah, I can imagine. I'd imagine McGruff the crime dog. That might be like Fauci. Like, hey, I'm here to protect you, but are you? Yeah. So you you think McGruff is a fraud too? Yeah, I do. Yeah. 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 Don't don't trust him. I did have a serious question at one point, but I've completely forgotten what it was. Yeah, um, must Scooby Doo. Yeah, Scooby Doo's a good guy, isn't he? Uh, well, that's a loaded question. Uh, <laughs> if we're getting into the Scooby Doo doctrine, um, well, Scooby Doo, honestly, he seems all goofy and slappy, kind of like Bill Gates. Um, but yeah, he, but know. he always gets his man right. He always gets the bad guy. That's true. But are they the bad guys that he gets? Or is he wiping out the good guys? And would he take a higher price from the government goons to turn those skills towards evil? Yes. Scooby-Doo has no morals. He is just a body for hire. Yeah. Yeah. Which gets me back to my thesis about dogs. It does. We need to get Scooby-Doo off the air because this show is propagating communism to children. And we need a genderless Scooby-Doo for the next generation yeah. that doesn't believe in truth. I don't know what a gender-neutral name for <laughs> previously known as Scooby-Doo would I be. Want a, I want a species-neutral name as well. I yeah. mean, like, let's not call Scooby-Doo a dog. Like, How uninclusive is that? Has anyone asked them what they think? The, they have not asked they what they think. <laughs> um, luckily, I remembered my question, so we're going to get out of this dog thing. Um, so one thing you were saying, and this, get, this gets to comedy, um, I had Penn Jillette on the show, and he is a self-described libertarian, uh, funny as hell. He's a great interview because all you have to do is say hi, <laughs> and then he talks for like three hours. But um, 
I was I was asking him the question, not, not unlike what I just asked you, but but I've learned a little bit. Like, how do we convince people? How do we persuade people? And he sort of scolded me. He's like, "That's not our job." And it's sort of it's sort of arrogant to think that it's our job to educate people on what's right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so so he just wants to open their eyes and and turn them on to a different perspective. And I think one thing about satire and comedy, it probably does that because it's not it's not yelling at you or preaching at you yeah. in a way that would turn you off like you suggested. So maybe maybe that's what it is. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know either. I have an opinion, and my opinion happens to agree with Penn Gillette, where you know, waking people up is as cliche as it sounds, but I, on on a good day, hopefully that's what my work accomplishes a little bit and I think your work and because waking people up what's that do it wakes them up to using their own mind not using their mind as a hard drive to run someone else's operating system but wake them up to uh, use their mind and their heart and if they have a connection to some kind of higher power abide by that yeah where Man, God help us if everybody thought the way I did. Uh, personally, the last thing I'd want to do is like brainwash everybody with my thinking. It's like, well, I think this is better thinking than like what you get on CNN, but uh, it would still be violating people's minds. So, personally, I don't care what anybody thinks. What I care, what I care about, is that their thinking comes from their mind. Yeah, and and I think. There's truths about people. I think when we're in touch with our true nature, we're inherently good, kind beings. We have good days. We have bad days. But on the whole, like we're pack animals. We're built to function in packs. We don't, you know, like, ah, there's another human. Let me kill them. Automat- no, like when, when we're in our truth, we're friendly with each other. And, and that's great. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I think waking people up and with satire, sometimes you do that by like, what's the truth you believe? Cool. Here's an opposing truth. Not for the purpose of get you to believe this opposing truth, but it just it snaps one out of the hypnotic suggestion that they're they don't know they're in. So on the optimistic side and the, the really dramatic growth in your 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 community or your following or whatever you call it, um, I do think there is a counter revolution where people are. Are finding their freedom and they're turned off by this authoritarian monolith of, of media and politics and and busybodies that want to tell us how to live yeah. um, that's that's got to be part of this and I, it's not just you there's a there's this whole um, counterculture media that starts with st. st. Rogan and maybe works its way down to us small people um, I, I think that that's like that's that's the counterculture that might turn young people on to this idea of freedom. I, I agree, and and I personally feel optimistic about it. I think like the counterculture, you know, one of the buzzwords now. We could probably say that's decentralized communication, even though it's for the most part run on centralized platforms, like even Saint Rogan, he's on Spotify. Yeah, but it's he's him and, and you and I were decentralized in the sense that we don't get marching orders from anyone other than our minds, our hearts and whatever our soul's mission is. So whereas you look at CNN, you well, know, just let Bro- project Veritas tell you how centralized they are and yeah. people talking at you, man, they're getting their orders from someone above them. So I do think the counterculture is, it's a movement that I don't know if it can be stopped. It has a lot of momentum. I think people know there's truth, there's authenticity. authenticity. People are way smarter than maybe authoritarians like to give them credit for, but we know when someone's being disingenuous or not. And the counterculture, what makes it different is People are authentic and they're real. Whereas you turn on CNN or any news, like people, they're not even talking in normal tones of voice. They're like, oh, the top story today, I'm not even talking like a fucking human being. (laughs) 
It's very disingenuous. Yeah. You watch yeah. Biden try to read off a teleprompter, which is just, it's fascinating. I love it. But also it's like, that's, that's like you sat down here with me, no notes. You're looking me in the eye. You're connecting with me. We're having a, a wonderful conversation in depth and we don't need a teleprompter. Why? Because we're here being present and riding the wave of authenticity as it arises between us in the moment. Whereas our leaders, why do they need to read a teleprompter in words off that that someone else wrote for them? Okay. I, re I really want to get uh, watch some of Joe Biden's press conferences, and I want to run up there with a blanket and just hug him or something. He, he's so lost. Yeah, I, I love it when, he, like, he starts going off script. And, you know, his handlers are just stressing yeah. out. Yeah, like, yeah. Okay, now Joe's... Let's, let's get him to an ice cream shop pronto. Pretty much. Okay, photo op. That went bad. Photo op time, guys. So how do people get uh, more JP? you got a number of uh, projects going on. Get, do a selfless, self a s not selfless, self-promotion. Sure. Uh, more than happy to. So probably the best place to connect with me... Um, my newsletter, it, it's something I love to connect with people behind the scenes communication and it's uncensored. It's not big tech stuff. So my newsletter is the best way to be in touch with me. You can jump on my website, awakenwithjp.com and you'll see, you can just can drop your email in there and you'll get some private communication from me about once a week or so. And then, on you know, social media is as long as I'm still up there I'm at awaken with JP and the newsletter is sort of the the security strategy in case someday you just disappear from social media it is yeah, yeah. And, and there's additional security strategies being orchestrated now but as of now the one that's got its feet on the ground it's the email newsletter Oh, very cool. This, this has been fun. Let's, I hope we can do it again sometime. I would I love that, brother. Thank you for having me on. Thank you. That was amazing. Where can I get more content just like that? It's a great question. You're clearly a discerning consumer of the best content. Make sure to like the video, subscribe, and click the bell. And if you're consuming podcasts, go to Apple, Stitcher, anywhere you get them. I'm in. Kibbe on Liberty. Honest conversations with interesting people. Thank you.